Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this special Zoom event in Barry College's Creative Writing Reading Series, a poetry reading by Victoria Chang. Tonight's reading is sponsored by the Georgia Poetry Circuit and Barry College. For those Barry College students here, for cultural events credit, uh, we've posted uh, a note that we will during the Q&A following the reading, post the actual link that you need to follow to take you to a short survey that you should answer within 24 hours. Um, I also posted a message that you'll see that uh, you can also post questions for the, the Q&A with the poet uh, following the reading in the Q&A part instead of in chat. Okay, so any questions that you have for the poet for the end of the reading, post those in the Q&A section. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Victoria Chang. After earning a BA in Asian Studies from the University of Michigan, Chang completed an MA in Asian Studies from Harvard University, an MBA from Stanford University, and an MFA from the Warren Wilson MFA Program for Writers. Her collections of poetry include Circle, winner of the Crab Orchard Review Award Series in Poetry, Salvinia Molesta, The Boss, Barbie Chang, and her most recent, Obit, which was long listed for the 2020 National Book Award in Poetry. Her poems have been published in the Kenyan Review, Poetry, the Three Penny Review, Best American Poetry, and numerous other venues. Chang is also the editor of the anthology Asian American Poetry, The Next Generation. In addition to writing poetry and editing, he writes children's books and teaches in Antioch University's MFA program. In 2017, she was awarded a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. Darkness is not the absorption of color, but the absorption of language. Chang writes, and suffering changes shape and happens secretly. In Obit's poems, written after the death of her mother, Chang brings the intimate secret workings of grief to light through a brilliant lyric reimagining of that most public language of loss, the newspaper obituary. One of the stunning realities of being human is that in what we think of as the happiest life, meaning one unmarked by unexpected tragedy by early death, the parent dies before the child, which means the happiest life will be deeply scored by loss. For one feels the overwhelming pain of being orphaned, no matter their age. For Chang, it is as if, as if she has switched places with her shadow. Writing of her mother's illness and death, her father's disabling stroke, in Obit Chang explores how loss colors every aspect of a survivor's life, memorializing the death of her mother, of her father's frontal lobe, but also empathy, also language and logic, optimism and home, her mother's teeth, and her mother's blue dress. Even time after a death changes shape, Chang writes. After a death, there is no moving on despite the people waving us on through the broken lights. Chang also writes about the disorienting in-betweenness of serving as caretaker to her own children as well as her parents, how it is strange to help someone grow while helping someone die. Teaching someone to grow is also, though, being with them in their own loss. In one poem, we see her taking her children to visit their grandmother's grave a year after her death, together bringing flowers and pinwheels. And suddenly, she writes, they're all sobbing. Sadness, Chang writes, is plural, but grief is singular and takes many forms as tears or pinwheels. 
These powerfully moving poems are a singular expression of one woman's grief, resonating with the collective sadness that is at the core of being human. For to feel such loss, one must first have loved deeply. Obit is a rare achievement by one of our best contemporary poets, and we are grateful and honored now to welcome Victoria Chang. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. That was such a wonderful introduction. Thank you for taking the time to, to write that. I know how much work that can be. So I appreciate the effort and the time in, in doing that. Um, thanks people who are here and for coming. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna just uh, start reading and thank you for to the Georgia circuit and everyone who has a hand in planning that I know how that is uh, a big endeavor and um, involves a lot of people doing a lot of coordination so I really I really appreciate that um, and all the people that work on that I'm happy to be here um, I'm going to uh, read a poem from my uh, previous book which is one and then I'll read some poems from Obit and um, sort of go from there. Let's see, I'll read this one. It's called um, Dear P. Someone will love you. Many will love you. Many will brother you. Some of these loves will bother you. Some will leave you. One might haunt you, hunt you in your sleep, make you weep a tearless kind of weep the kind of weep that drowns your organs slowly. There are little oars in your body, little boats. Grab on to them and row and row. Someone will tell you no, but you won't know he is right until you have already wrung your own heart dry, your hands dripping knives, until you have already reached your hands into his body and put them through his heart. Love is the only thing that is not an argument. Um, so I will read a few of these from, from this book, um, Obit, um, which uh, maybe just a quick um, background is that my, my mother passed away uh, from pulmonary fibrosis in 2015. And um, no one knows sort of why people get pulmonary fibrosis, but in it's, uh, it, it's similar to, um, I think it's co COVID. I don't know actually what it's called, but it's when people smoke and they also have lung issues, but it actually is similar to that. And um, sometimes people get pulmonary fibrosis from asbestos or something else um, environmental, but there really is no explanation and no, no cure. So your lungs sort of harden and then you kind of gradually suffocate to death and it can be very gradual. My mother was diagnosed with um, pulmonary fibrosis in her forties and, um, died much, much later. Um, and my dad, the other thing, you know, my dad had a stroke in, I don't remember when, maybe 12 years ago. And so he has uh, aphasia and, um, and uh, meaning he can't really communicate very well at all, actually, and has had a, a few more falls and various things. So he appears in this book quite a bit. Um, but when my mother died, I didn't want to write, uh, I said this earlier in the class today, I didn't really want to write elegies because um, the allergy form seemed already so uh, well done by others, much more talented and capable than myself. Um, and um, so I purposely just didn't want to write any elegies for my mother. And then um, one day I was in the car and I was listening to NPR and they were talking about this documentary called Obit where um, someone was right, uh, had made a documentary about obituary writers, which is fascinating actually. Um, I was talking earlier too about how obituary writers um, for like celebrities and things have written the obituaries long before people have actually died. Um, I learned a lot actually just listening to that but something about listening to that uh, that episode on NPR just um, I don't know inspired me and I went home and wrote the first um, obituary in this book on page five and um, and then I just kept on going. So I wrote about 70 of them in two weeks and then I worked on them for a couple more years. Um, so maybe, um, 
maybe I'll just actually, I'll, I'll start reading that one and then we'll sort of, and then I'll follow the list of poems that I've written down to read. So this is the first one I wrote. It's called My Father's Frontal Lobe. My father's frontal lobe died unpeacefully of a stroke on June 24th, 2009 at Scripps Memorial Hospital in San Diego, California. Born January 20th, 1940, the frontal lobe enjoyed a good life. The frontal lobe loved being the boss. It tried to talk again, but someone put a bag over it. When the frontal lobe died, it sucked in its lips like a window pulled shut. At the funeral for his words, my father wouldn't stop talking and his love passed through me, fell onto the ground that wasn't there. I could hear someone stomping their feet. The body is as confusing as language. Was the frontal lobe having a tantrum or dancing? When I took my father's phone away, his words died in the plastic coffin. At the funeral for his words, we argued about my miscarriage. It's not really a baby, he said. I ran out of words, stomped out to shake the dead baby awake. I thought of the tech who put the wand down, quietly left the room when she couldn't find the heartbeat. I understood then that darkness is falling without an end, that darkness is not the absorption of color, but the absorption of language. I should have mentioned they all look like um, newspaper obituaries. Um, because why, I don't know. <laughs> but um, everything died for me slowly. And so in this book, I think death was very fragmented um, and grief was very fragmented. And I apologize ahead of time, you may hear my two wiener dogs barking, mustard and ketchup, of which the barker is mustard. Um, and he barks at everything, so. Um, this one is called Memory. Memory died August 3rd, 2015. The death was not sudden, but slowly over a decade. I wonder if when people die, they hear a bell, or if they taste something sweet, or if they feel a knife cutting them in half, dragging through the flesh like sheet cake. The caretaker who witnessed my mother's death quit. She holds the memory and images, and now they are gone. For the rest of her life, the memories are hers. She said my mother couldn't breathe, then took her last breath 20 seconds later. The way I have imagined a kiss with many men I have never kissed. My memory of my mother's death can't be a memory, but is an imagination. Each time the wind blows, leaves unfurl a little differently. This one is called Friendships. Friendships died June 24th, 2009. Once beloved, but not consistently beloved. The mirror won the battle. I am now imprisoned in the mirror, all myself spread out like a deck of cards. It's true, the grieving speak a different language. I am separated from my friends by gauze. I'll drive myself to my own house for the party. I'll make small talk with myself, spill a drink on myself. When it's over, I'll drive myself back to my own house. My conversations with other parents about children pass me on the way up the staircase and repeat on the way down. Before my mother's death, I sat anywhere. Now I look for the image of the empty chair near the image of the empty table. An image is a kind of distance. An image of me sits down. Depression is a glove over the heart. Depression is an image of a glove over the image of a heart. Um, so my mother had dentures and actually for as long as I remembered and I saw everywhere in the house was always like a cup, a glass with in some sort of polydent mixture with her dentures. Um, this one's called My Mother's Teeth. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease, once again in August 3rd, 2015. The fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, 
her words around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. Um, so I wrote about 70 of these. I, I didn't really, I don't know how many exactly, I never counted, but uh, then I sort of stopped one day. I don't really know why, but I just maybe got tired. <laughs> and then um, let them sit for a while and then wrote, just started messing around and writing a lot of formal poems, sonnets, pantoums, sestinas. I discovered how much I loved the sestina, villanelles, you know. And then I started writing tankas, which are um, a Japanese syllabic form that's slightly more expansive than the haiku. Um, and it's 57577, five, seven, seven. so 31 syllables total. And I just sort of shoved all those poems in the back of this manuscript. And then my friend um, was uh, looking at them and reading the manuscript and saying, why are these back here? You need to you know, get rid of all of these other poems and then keep these these tankas and um, sprinkle them throughout the manuscript because they're it just into children sort of thing, all children. And so um, I paired them up into to, to couple like two, and then I spread them across the manuscript. And um, I think they actually, in retrospect, and I've seen people write about this, is that they serve as a nice sort of re relief from the the more sort of um, oppressive you know, obituary poems. So I'll just read four, which are two pairs. So here's the first pair that I'll read. I tell my children that hope is like a blue skirt. It can twirl and twirl, that men like to open it, take it apart and wound it. I tell my children that sometimes I too can hope, that sometimes nothing moves but my love for someone and the light from the dead star. And these are actually really hard to write because um, with syllabics, you know, you, you might get a line or find something that you really like, but it has a, an extra syllable or a, a syllable short, and then you have to start all over again at the beginning. And so um, in that way, it was, it was frustrating, but also in some ways, extra challenging to write. Um, I'll hear two more. Do you see the tree? Its secrets grow as lemons. Sometimes I pretend I love my children more than words. No one knows this but words. My children, children, today my hands are dreaming as they touch your hair. Your hair turns into winter. When I die, your hair will snow. So I will read a few more of these obituaries. Maybe end with a tanka. I don't know how long I'm supposed to read for, but I can see how it goes. This one's called Grief. Grief as I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains, but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The texts kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky. That is grief. This one is called the blue dress. 
The blue dress died on August 6, 2015, along with the little blue flowers, all silent. Once the petals looked up, now small pieces of dust. I wonder whether they burned the dress or just the body. I wonder who lifted her up into the fire. I wonder if her hair brushed his cheek before it grew into a bonfire. I wonder what sound the body made as it burned. They dyed her hair for the funeral, too black. She looked like a comic character. I waited for the next comic panel to see the speech bubble and what she might say. But her words never came and we were left with the stillness of blown glass the irreversibility of rain, and millions of little blue flowers. Imagination is having to live in a dead person's future. Grief is wearing a dead person's dress forever. Uh, maybe I'll read one more obit, and then I'll read one more set of tonka, if that's okay. Um, so I... Um, I think I wrote most of, like, I think I wrote all of these in that two week period. And then um, uh, an editor from terrain.org maybe had seen a few out in the world of these obituaries and asked me to write uh, one for America. And so um, it's a it's an online literary magazine and they have this series of epistolary um, things. You know, they could be essays or anything really fiction. Um, called Dear America. So you just, as a writer, write a letter to America. And um, initially I, di I didn't wanna do it because I, I just felt like I'm particularly bad at writing towards prompts, um, you know, despite delivering them all the time to other people. But I, I thought maybe um, I'll give it a try. So this is the last obituary in, in the book and it's to America and it's, um, the only thing you need to know, or maybe you don't need to know anything, but it's um, related to the Marjorie Stoneman shooting in Florida. America, died on February 14, 2018. And my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with the hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind, and when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. Maybe I'll end with um, the last poem in the book where it's just two tankas um, and I'll end with these. I am ready to admit I love my children. To admit this is to admit that they will die, die. No one knows this but words. My children, children. This poem will not end because I'm trying to end this poem with hope, hope, hope. See how the mouth stays open? Thank you. That was really beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so now we have time for questions. So if you would, if you have a question, just type it into the Q&A and hopefully I should be able to see that, then I can read it aloud for Victoria. So um, 
Victoria, you said that you wrote the the rough draft in a couple of weeks, and then it was two years, three years of revision work after that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, yeah, just um, every second I got, you know, and I'm I'm a pretty busy person. I think everyone's really busy, but I feel like I I'm particularly self busy like I, I and I said this earlier too it's that I feel like sometimes I make myself so busy so I don't have to feel anything <laughs> um, that's a sort of a bit of self-awareness there and so I think um, I think I'm particularly busy but then I because of that I just carry things around with me that I'm really obsessing about at the moment and so it was really like every second every spare moment was working on this um, this book and every poem I, I I think at some point I had like three or four feet of, of drafts that I mentioned again earlier in class today that I just finally threw away um but it's just uh just kept on going over them over aloud reading them aloud and trying to make them um stronger as as poems and so once after those two weeks sort of occurred then it's when I started you know sculpting the sculptures if that makes sense making them into poems you know um versus just the you know the the barfing aspect of writing <laughs> so um, questions now yeah. um so elena says that was beautiful what advice do you have for finding the right words in your writing <laughs> hey if i had the answer <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't be sitting here um i think finding the right words for your writing is part of the project of the the writer and um, I think that that it's really the finding just everything that you're writing requires something different. And I think that that for writers that can be the exciting part of writing, whatever you're working on can demand something different from you as a writer. And so um, I think the best way to answer that question is to ask the poems, you know, ask the, the novel or ask the memoir or whatever you're working on what it wants to say and it will answer you if you lean in with your whole body and listen to it um it may take a while to sort of determine what that means and figure that out but um no one really knows that better than what you're working on i see them do you want me to oh you can keep reading i'll let you read <laughs> yeah, there there are two that are sort of related so maybe we can bring those together um, so one is, how has writing these poems helped you cope with the grief you have faced over the last few years? And then the other one is, does writing about the death of your mother help you to process the loss? Listening has me grieving all over again for my mom. Yeah. Well, um, I do feel like I don't know if I, I don't know if coping is what I wanted to do. I mean, I think as a writer, I think as a writer, I mean, I feel like it's the only thing that I, I it's a thing that I do, you know. Um, I feel like I could have done a lot of things with my life, but whatever I ended up doing, I feel like I would have always written. And so it's just the way that I process the, the act of sort of being on this earth and so I don't know if I ever think of writing as coping so much as it's just my way of being um and I do feel like I I don't love it or hate it I just need it um and so if that's a form of coping then maybe that is coping and that's the right way to say it and um and I mean, yeah, I'm, I I know that feeling of of re grieving, um, but you never re grieve. You sort of like enter new phases of grief, and grief sort of returns in so many different ways. Um, and the thing that I've learned is that when someone like your mother dies, it never you just you never it never that hole never refills, and so. Um, which is which is amazing because I wish I could go back and tell my mother like that she meant so much to me and had such a big impact on my life, but 
it's too late, you know, and you, and that's, that's the grief. It's like, you wish you could do that, but it's, it's that hole that can never quite be filled. Um, and, uh, and you're reminded every day of that. And I, I don't know, I feel like some people might grieve harder or a little bit more differently. I definitely was surprised at how much I grieved and how hard I grieved for my mother. Cause although I was really close with my mom, it's not like we were you know, soulmates or anything, but I suddenly realized it's like, wow, my mom is such a big part of me. And you don't, for, for some of us, you know, um, we don't realize that until it's, it's too late. So I think, yes, I do feel like on a daily basis, um, I grieve at different times of the day and it's been five, six, who knows years at this point, but it still feels very raw. The next question is asking, what is the most difficult part of the writing process for you? All of it. <laughs> um, it's all different. I think it depends on what you're working on. Like I am working on this hybrid thing I was talking about earlier today that has visual aspects. Uh, I'm not a visual artist. I took art drawing classes all growing up. In fact, that's what I started doing, taking drawing classes, not writing classes or writing. I wasn't writing. I was sort of drawing, always drawing. And uh um, but it's, I'm not, you know, I'm not a visual artist. I'm, I'm an aesthetic person in that I care a lot about how things look. I really love thinking about those things, design and, you know, architecture, um, visual art, um, sculpture, but I can't really make it myself that well, but this particular manuscript that I'm working on does contain visual elements. So I think it depends on what you're working on. Um, I think everything you're working on may challenge you in a different way. And so I think in that way, the writer is never done. And I think that's what makes writing so fun, yet also really challenging. You have to be really nimble and just take it as it comes. And um, and I just love it so much. It's so hard in all different ways, but I love how hard it is. And it's so fun for me because it's so hard. And I think, it's, I don't know that phrase, is it not for the faint of heart? And I'm terrible at these, whatever you call them, cliches? No, mal no, not, they're not malapropisms. There's a word for, what is it called? Maxims, maybe? Maxims? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, idioms? I don't know. Because my parents spoke Chinese at home. So I, it suddenly occurs to me that I don't really know these very well, even though I was born here. But um, yeah, writing is not for the faint of heart, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging, but you have to want to be challenged and enjoy that challenge. Otherwise there are way easier things to do. That's what I always tell people. My well, next question is sort of related. Uh, so Cammy says, so beautiful. When you are editing, what do you pay attention to the most? What is the process like for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, editing is so fun. Um, I love it because then you're sort of, you finished that sort of like that barfing part of writing. And so um, the editing is just uh, putting a slightly different sort of hat on, you know, and um, I find I can use some of my analytical brain for, for editing. And uh, I do love that part of um, thinking too. And so it's, it's just sort of trying to be a, uh, uh, maybe like a classmate to, to myself, you know, in a, in a workshop. And that's when I could be a little more objective. And um, I just am looking for different things at different times. And so if I'm working on something like this for a couple of years, um, at some point I get sort of too familiar with it. And then I'll just artificially create little exercises for myself. Like, oh, today I'm just going to read the last four lines of every poem and work on those and um, and I will maybe get through some poems and then run out of time. And then the next day I'll pick up where I left off and finish that. And then if I'm you know, having trouble again today, I will just look at the first four lines of every poem. <laughs> you know, I, I do that um, for myself just to keep things interesting. And then also when you give yourself an assignment, it, it you're, it's amazing, your brain empties out everything else. And so you really are focusing on the first four lines of every poem. Um, and then you start to see patterns. You're like, oh, I do this a lot in the beginnings of my poems, or I do this a lot in the endings of my poems. Um, and so I do that kind of stuff. I just make up little 
assignments for myself. So that's how I edit. And sometimes I just read from front to end um, uh, throughout through the whole manuscript aloud. Um, I hardly make it through because that's a huge time commitment. But with this hybrid manuscript that I'm working through, it's about 100 plus pages. I will spend, I have spent the last six months, every weekend, eight hours a day um, working, getting through that whole thing. Um, and I'm just ready to kill myself sometimes, but it is, it's, it's uh, there's a, there's a deadline and it's really bad right now. So I've been working really hard on that. And then sometimes I'll read it backwards. Other times I'll start in the middle, you know? And so um, other times in the middle and then I'll go backwards from the middle. So I do, that's how I edit. I just sort of try and keep things fun for myself and trying to get myself to forget what I've just read, if that makes sense. So interesting. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I love that idea of, of doing all the beginnings and all the endings and, and taking it out of context like that. That's such a cool idea. Uh, the next question is, uh, how or when did you start writing poetry and how did you get it out there to be read by others? Yeah. Um, and to build on that earlier, the, the other comment too, it's like sometimes I'll just look at images. So um, something really fun is I'm just going to look at images today. I'm just going to work on my images or I'm just going to work on sound, you know, um, and thinking about sound. And so there are so many things, line breaks. There's so many things that you could do. Um, so poetry, you know, I, I went to um, public schools all growing up and um, and we in Michigan and they uh, it was just great. I mean, I hate it growing from Michigan. Um, sorry if there's anyone from Michigan. I hate everything about it. But one thing I really enjoyed about it was that the schools were really um, great and that they had little poetry contests and things. I just got little kids writing poetry. So I started writing poems in second grade, maybe third grade, little poems, and everyone won. So it was really great. There was like first place, second place, third place, but they had like a hundred first place, a hundred second place, hundred third place. So they're really positive and encouraging. And um, that's when I started writing poems. And, and then as, as I feel like growing up in Michigan was really hard, I, I started to actually lean into poems more and more. And I struggled a lot in, as a kid and um, uh, experienced a lot of bullying and various things in Michigan, as you can imagine, um, at the time. And so it was just a great way for me to be able to um, have something to, to to talk to, have someone to talk to, which were words. And never, I never really stopped, I think. In high school, I kept on writing. I had a great high school teacher named Mrs. Line Weber, who made us memorize Emily Dickinson. Um, still, I still know those, those poems. We had a great English teacher named Mr. Corcoran, who um, had us reading Hemingway and Lord of the Flies and just everything. He read them aloud to us. So just sitting there and just watching him walk back and forth and read entire books aloud to us was really, really cool. And so I think that that's sort of when I began to, to really like writing. And then I took um, classes at the University of Michigan. I'll, every term I said, I'm gonna take a poetry class. And so I got to learn more and more. I just kept on going while doing a lot of other things, but I always kind of continued to write poetry. When did you first start sending them out to? Oh yeah, that's right, that part. You know, I, uh, you know, a little bit of encouragement here and there can always be really, it just can do wonders. But I think in college, um, I won this like a uh, little contesty thing at University of Michigan, it's called the Hopwood Award. And um, for undergraduates and I had won something there. And that sort of was the first time I thought maybe maybe I could send some of these out. And so I started sending them out to, there's some great um, journals out there that take undergraduate poetry. Um, and so I started sending a few out here and there. And so it was in college, it was the first time um, I started publishing poems just sort of for fun. I think like the Lull Water Review was one of them. And there are just a few undergraduate places that you could also publish and then, um, yeah, and then I just started doing a whole bunch of other things and, and fell out of poetry for a while. Um, and But it wasn't until I decided to get, get back into poetry, which must have been in my 30s. Um, I, it took a whole probably decade um, before I 
got came back to poetry and I took a class at the Stanford Continuing Studies um, online, no, actually in person. And my teacher was Rick Barrett, um, the wonderful poet and very good friend of mine now, um, Rick Barrett. And he just opened me um, back in my mind back into poetry. And, and then I started really just, I was so moved by all the poems he brought in and the way he taught that I, I basically never, I haven't stopped since then. We have two more questions. Uh, so this one is, I, I find that I write to get rid of things. I suppose emotions such as grief are afraid of my negative reviews of them. Does it work this way for you or does it linger just the same? Uh -huh. So writing for you is a form of sort of expulsion. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, I, I find for me writing is, so for this book, I, it was kind of like um, I was talking to an imaginary friend. So I was trying to figure out if I could explain to my imaginary friend how awful I was feeling. Is it possible to um, find language to explain and articulate emotions that are, or any emotions really? I mean, even happiness and joy, it's sadness and grief, anger. I mean, how do you even use language to describe those things? And so for me, it was about, and I wrote about, I've you know been writing these hybrid things. And I think in one of them, I wrote something like, um, I feel like writing is uh, kind of taking language and trying to attach them to things that are moving and that are invisible. That's what writing feels like to me. Um, and how desperately fun. And because you can never, I think, truly fully, articulate what it is to be human in some of our deepest, deepest feelings and emotions. That's what makes it fun for me is that I know I'm going to fail every single time. And if I can even just get even like a foot away from describing some deeper emotions, then that is good enough, you know? And so, yeah, I think that's, that's how I think of writing for me. I love that idea of, of just thinking you're going to fail. And it seems like that just takes so much pressure off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we actually have two more questions. Um, can you talk about how you start your writing process? To me, beginning is the hardest part. So I was curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think that's like asking artists in general, like where do you get your inspiration? And when do you actually sit down and start writing? Um, I think that's that's hard because I think um, for me, I don't have a lot of time. And so I, it's not like I sit down and say, I'm going to write or for me, it's like, I, I have to wait so long to find the time to write. And then, you know, then I just, I have to be alone. You know, I need to be sort of in the dark. I have a lot of criteria before I can feel comfortable writing. And so um, I don't actually write that much. And so I think for me, writing is a collection of years of wanting to write. And so, um, so yeah, I think, I think though that, um, I wish I were a more practice writer. So I would have, you know, ex writing exercises or give myself assignments to sit down and write. I, I think that that's a good way to start writing. Um, but I think it's really hard to sit, just sit down and start writing. I wouldn't actually know what to do right now if you told me to sit down and start writing. I'm not sure what I would do. Um, but I think that, like I was saying earlier in class today, no matter what, what you're given to write like prompts and things your own obsessions will come out somehow like whatever they are and you may not know what those current obsessions are or current feelings or emotions but they will emerge um you can give someone like 10 writing exercises and you know sometimes i think that some of those obsessions will appear over and over in some of those different 10 poems um so yeah i mean how to start i am the worst person to ask um so yeah i don't have a good answer no, that's great. So the last question is, do you think writing is a great way to get rid of stress? 
<laughs> no, I think writing causes stress. Um, yeah, I think, um, no, I, I'm joking. I always say that like a great way to, uh, I don't know, just sort of decompress is um, just free write, you know, uh, get a composition notebook and start at the very top and just don't stop writing until you're at the bottom right hand corner. Um, and don't write about like don't don't write about anything in particular and if you don't know what to write about just say i i don't write down i, I don't know what to write about and just write kind of what you're feeling at the very second um you know this is so dumb why am i doing this and then suddenly at some point you start writing um things and then you can start to feel yourself getting into that groove of where you're just uh, you're just expressing. And so in that way, I, I think that is super helpful and useful and reflective. I mean, we talked about journal writing today and diary writing and how those of us who are writers um, maybe have written a lot of diaries and journals in our lives because that's just who we are. It's a way of emoting and expressing. Um, and it didn't, it took me a long time to realize that, that not everyone did that growing up <laughs> that people didn't they don't have a single diary and it's like that is crazy you know and for me as a writer and I think for those of us that that like to write um it's like we have stacks of them um that we probably all want to burn before we die kind of thing but um I do think that um it can be especially useful for kids and younger people or people dealing with all sorts of things to, to journal and to free write. All right, so we have one more that snuck in here. This is a <laughs> short one for you. Uh, they say, I really thought the, the boss was great. Your book, The Boss. How can yeah. I really like you? <laughs> you can't um, because you're not me and I can't write like you. So um, I think uh, I like to think about it as a fingerprint, you know, um, and we each have a fingerprint that is kind of crazy to think about that there's not a single person on this planet or in history that has ever had your same fingerprint. I just can never get my head around that in history ever, um, which is kind of cool. Like I think about like when writers feel demoralized, it's like, oh, there's so many right, great writers out there. There's so many people it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, you have your own fingerprint. So you should be able to write something that's absolutely unique to yourself. Um, if you read a lot, think a lot, live a really rich life, um, I, I feel like you should be able to write like yourself. And that's really the goal is to write like yourself and to find who you are as a person and a writer. Um, you may mimic other people to learn how to write. Um, I did my fair share of that early on. And I think that um, eventually though, if you're lucky and if you keep going and persisting, you can find yourself. And it's really no different, I feel, than finding yourself as a person. Um, that's a lifelong project. I, I have not figured out half of who I am. And every day I feel like uh, a bit lost in terms of who am I, right? And that's very similar to what the writing process for me at least feels like is trying to figure out what kind of writer am I? Um, and it's very much so tied to me trying to figure out who I am as a person and who I want to be as a person um, in the very short period of time that we are each here. And so that's what I would say is like, find yourself, um, but read a lot, read a lot of other people and read very broadly. So I love reading very broadly. Um, that's super important to the process as well. All right, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for this, Victoria. It was really Thank you. great talking. Yeah. Thank Thanks you all. Thanks for coming, whoever's here. <laughs> I can't see anyone, but I guess I could see. Actually, I can see who's here. I can, yeah. Just a last thought somebody's throwing out that Victoria Chang has officially changed my life. Do you have any <laughs> life advice? Maybe basic they life advice. <laughs> yeah, basic Is there like advanced life advice versus basic <laughs> life advice? Um, you know, I don't know if I have any basic life advice. I would say that, um, you know, for me, community is hugely important. So, uh, 
you know, and I try and teach my own children this is what are you going to um, give to the world, you know, versus what you're going to take from the world. And that I think about that every single day um, of, of, you know, what I take is way going to be less impactful than what I actually give back. So anything that I may sort of get or achieve or accomplish, I give back seven times more because that is more important to me than, than all the things that I'm able to collect, you know, whether it's money or, you know, whatever, you know, I think that that sort of um, is, is, is hopefully what I'm hoping to leave, you know, on the, on the earth when I'm, when I'm gone myself. So I guess that's the basic life advice I would give you. That's wonderful. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you again for, for everything. And thank you all for being here. Well, See you again. Thank yeah, you. thanks for hosting me, Sandra. Thank you so much, William. Yeah. Take care. You Bye, too. everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Can I just leave or do you want me to? <laughs> okay, oh, yeah. take care. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.